Learning Director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. On behalf of the Learning Network team, I would like to welcome everyone to this resource spotlight, Maltreatment in Sport, Current Knowledge and Future Directions. Our center is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Attawandarons peoples. Please think about the traditional lands you are currently situated on and join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of Indigenous peoples. The ongoing work to make the promise of truth and reconciliation real in our communities and in particular to bring justice for murdered and missing Two-Spirit and Indigenous women and girls across the country informs our discussions in this resource spotlight and beyond. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Gretchen Kerr is a professor and dean in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Toronto and a co-director of eAlliance, the Canadian Gender Equality in Sport Research Hub. Her research focuses on safe sport and specifically on athletes' experiences of gender-based violence and maltreatment. Gretchen was the senior author of Canada's first national prevalence study of maltreatment among current and former national team members and was the subject matter expert in the development of the Universal Code of Conduct to Prevent and Address Maltreatment, a policy mandated for all national sport organizations by Sport Canada. For over 30 years, Gretchen has served as a volunteer athlete welfare officer, a role that involves managing and investigating complaints of athlete maltreatment. Erin Wilson is an Olympian in the sport of artistic swimming and is currently a PhD candidate in the Factor of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Toronto. Her areas of research interest include maltreatment in sport, athlete empowerment and advocacy, which stemmed from her own experience training on the Canadian national team. Erin is also the current president of Athlete Can, which advocates for the rights of national team athletes in Canada. And I wanted to say that I shared with Erin that Erin is the very first Olympian that has ever presented on the Learning Network platform. And we're very honored to have her with us as well as Gretchen today. And I'm now going to turn it over to Professor Gretchen Kerr. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, the invitation for Erin and I to be part of your session today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see the uh, interest in this topic, uh, something that Aaron and I care very deeply about, uh, not just from an academic perspective, but uh, both of us are work very uh, closely with uh, sport organizations and sport stakeholders on the ground. And uh, we, we just see how important addressing this topic is. And, and this session, of course, is probably couldn't be more timely. Uh, I, I would venture to say that I don't think that uh, the, the public has ever been so attuned to gender-based violence in sport as it is at the moment uh, between the um, cases of uh, athlete maltreatment and various types of abuses that we're hearing about in the, the public to the horrific stories of, um, of athletes as perpetrators of gender-based violence as in the Hockey Canada uh, cases. So it's, it's a very um, timely topic and uh, one that uh, clearly needs um, strong uh, research endeavors, as well as uh, applied changes. 
So we look forward to talking to you about what we know, the current state of knowledge, as well as our thoughts about where we need to go in terms of addressing gender-based violence in sport. So thank you again for joining us. Today, um, we will, uh, whoops, let's go back here. Um, so uh, I will start by setting the stage a little bit in terms of why gender-based violence in sport is, is such an important topic. Um, and then I will turn it over to Aaron to talk about what we know about the types of gender-based violence in sport, a bit about the prevalence and their effects on athletes. And then I will talk about um, uh, implications and summary messages. So let me start by, by framing this topic, although it's on gender-based violence, um, it fits within the broader uh, scope of work on sport, which really indicates the, the benefits, the potential benefits of sport engagement. Uh, the research evidence is clear that when it's designed and delivered in safe, healthy, developmentally appropriate ways, there are numerous benefits. And I'm sure we all know stories of um, young people who have managed to get through school despite difficult circumstances uh, by virtue of their sport experience or uh, people who have navigated important uh, and difficult life circumstances by virtue of their sport engagement. So when it's delivered uh, in safe, healthy, developmentally appropriate ways, there are numerous health and developmental benefits for individuals and for communities. So not to lose sight of uh, the potential benefits. Um, and, and this is the uh, experience for most participants, whether they're uh, children or adolescents or adults, whether they're able-bodied or uh, individuals with disabilities, most people glean very positive benefits from sport. And yet we can't ignore um, the fact that uh, abuses happen in sport. Uh, we have the Larry Nassar case in um, USA Gymnastics where hundreds of young women uh, were, were abused over the periods of decades. We have our own Canadian examples of Graham James and the Sheldon Kennedy story. Um, uh, and there were many other survivors. Um, and and the, the cases that reach the media tend to be ones about sexual abuse. Um, and yet, as you'll hear from the data, uh, the predominant form of maltreatment in sport is psychological abuse. And in this case, we have uh, examples of two female coaches who were sanctioned because of their psychologically uh, abusive behavior. So we can no longer um, uh, ignore the fact that maltreatment occurs in sport. And, you know, the fairly recent case of um, Kyle Beach and others, um, who, who came forward about uh, cases of sexual assault and very importantly, the ways in which the NHL covered it up. And of course, since this story, uh, the, the cases of sexual assaults in Hockey Canada and the great lengths that the organization went to to uh, keep these hidden under the rug um, uh, are just uh, disturbing to all of us. So while the Hockey Canada case talks about athletes being perpetrators of abuse, the, um, and we'd be happy to talk about it, that in the Q&A, uh, the focus of our presentation today will be on athletes who are recipients of harmful uh, behaviors. Interestingly, whether they are the recipients or the perpetrators, the causes are, are certainly similar. And the data is clear and there is a, a large body of work uh, internationally that indicates that whether it's recreational sport or high performance sport at the Olympic or international level, 
uh, whether it's a team or individual, female versus male, et cetera, uh, the potential for maltreatment to occur in sport uh, runs across the gamut. So, um, of course, there are circumstances where young people are vulnerable to uh, various forms of maltreatment. And many of those contributors are shared with the sport environment. But I do want to spend a moment talking about what's unique about the sport context that makes athletes particularly vulnerable to maltreatment and um, that make it very difficult to deal with cases of maltreatment. So one is the performance outcome focus. This is the emphasis on winning or getting to the podium. And this performance outcome uh, focus uh, blurs a lot of other considerations. So we see, uh, for example, um, parents uh, agreeing to move the family across the country or to send the child away to another uh, lo geographical location in order to better their chances of excelling in sport. Um, so this performance outcome uh, focus makes other considerations like health and well-being, long-term development of the person, sometimes secondary to the interest in winning. It also affects the ways in which sport organizations are structured in the sense that the livelihood of many coaches or administrators relies on the performance of these young athletes. So if your employment is dependent on the performance of others, you can see how that kind of contributes to a win at all costs approach. And that's related in some uh, ways to the power structures that exist in, uh, in sport. And in fact, some researchers have argued that sport at the elite level for young people is a form of child labor because essentially these young people are training and performing for the financial benefit of adults within the system. Um, there is a uniqueness to the coach-athlete relationship, and these characteristics uh, become heightened the further you move along the sport continuum. So, for example, at the recreational level or entry point to sport, these, these may not be characteristic of the coach-athlete relationship, but certainly as you become more competitive, as you start to travel to compete, these characteristics are quite common, where the, the athletes often spend more time with their coach than they do with their parents or family members. So there's a, a, a special kind of relationship that exists there. And athletes often refer to their coaches as a surrogate parent. Um, there's often training or traveling that occurs in isolation. Uh, potential for one-on-one -on -one interactions that are not open to the public. Uh, in many sport environments, training is, it takes place in a closed environment where people like parents are not allowed to observe. Um, so this is a point of vulnerability to um, uh, potential forms of maltreatment. Often in these cases of, of abuse, the, the, the first question that's posed is, where are the parents in this picture, particularly when we're talking about youth? And there's interesting research that addresses this question and shows that um, parents come into the sport environment, of course, wanting their best, the best for their children, um, and that they become socialized into the norms around sport in the same way that the athletes do. So a parent may come in and see um, that the coach and athlete are working alone together or that there is um, 
um, yelling or other kind of harmful behaviors occurring, but they look around at more experienced parents and see, well, they're not reacting to this. This must be the way sport is. This must be what it takes to become an elite athlete. So they eventually learn that uh, these behaviors that are not characteristic in other sectors in which young people are involved, um, but do occur in sport, are just normal in sport. And, and one of the interesting things that will, can, will, that will be a thread throughout this uh, presentation is the normalization of what are harmful behaviors in sport that would never be accepted in other domains in which young people reside at like the school system. We take the same behaviors uh, in, in school, teacher yelling harmful things at a student, the parents would be at the school immediately, the, the teacher would be sanctioned. And yet those same behaviors um, are normalized in the sport environment. And all you need to do is sit at the sidelines of uh, your local soccer um, field where youth are playing or attend a game in a hockey arena. And you can see this kind of socialization into norms that would not be accepted elsewhere. And uh, finally, and we'll come back to this later in the presentation, but one of the distinct features of the sport environment is that the, it is afforded a great deal of autonomy and it's self-regulating. And so unlike um, teachers that have a college of, of uh, teachers or physicians and sur surgeons with the college of physicians and sur surgeons, there is not the same uh, oversight or regulatory body in sport. Um, and therefore there is less ability to both define scope of practice, to define entry to practice requirements, um, to, uh, to sanction or to remove the ability of someone to coach. And this explains why we have coaches who get into trouble in one area or one sport, and they just travel around the country or to another country and continue to engage in these harmful behaviors. Um, so this lack of uh, regulation over sport is, is a huge contributor to both the occurrence of maltreatment and the difficulties in addressing it. And, and we will come back to this in more detail a little bit later. Uh, before I go on, I'm now going to turn it over to Erin. Um, again, just thank, every, thank you everyone for coming. It's, it's been interesting even seeing in the chat how many people come from different um, aspects and, and are bringing different experiences into this. So I just wanted to thank you for, for having Gretchen and I today. Um, so a little bit about me, I was an artistic swimmer. I did that for about 14 years. Um, and I, particularly on the national team, um, had a very emotionally abusive experience. It was a very toxic culture. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details because that information has become very public in the past year and a half in my life, um, including some Globe and Mail articles and, and the CBC following my um, current lawsuit against, um, against my sport organization. So um, to give some highlights, it was a very emotionally abusive environment. Um, it was the constant belittling, berating. My coach screamed at me every day. Um, body shaming was a really big thing where, where our, our weights were a, determined, a determining factor of our places on the team um, to the point where my, my CEO would send me emails and, and official formal letters warning me that if I didn't lose a pound and a half, my, my place on the team would be um, compromised to go to the Olympics. Um, so it was just a very toxic environment for me. But at the time, uh, this was 10 years ago, we didn't have that language. It wasn't language that I was familiar with. Abuse was never a term that was um, spoken about or thought about. The only thing I knew at that time was that I did not like the environment that I was in. It was not good for me. Um, at the Olympics, I had never felt worse about myself. My self-esteem was the lowest it had ever been in my life, which is just kind of backwards when we are, when you are at the top, um, you're at the top of your field or at the top of your game. So it was definitely an interesting experience. And some of the reasons that I wanted to share this today is because um, similar to the themes that Gretchen was talking about, a lot of these things are very normalized in sport. I thought I was the crazy one for not 
um, going along with this. There is a very big survival of the fittest mentality within sport. Um, and I had just convinced myself that I just wasn't strong enough to, to handle it. And so then it was like a personal problem. Um, again, this was like reinforced by my sport organization because when I would come to them, they would just dismiss my um, concerns and tell me that this is like how sport was supposed to be. Um, and so it took me a really long time to um, understand that these behaviors a, are not normal, um, and also that a lot of other people are experiencing the same thing, which is really what got me into this field of research. Um, some other things to, to talk about is um, I thought that leaving the sport would fix all my problems, and I think this is a lot of um, a big misnomer in terms of um, people that are trying to care for athletes who experience abuse is because it's a sport problem, it only um, affects athletes when they're in their sport. And to be honest, I was the first one who thought as soon as I left my sport and as soon as I started going to school, all of my problems would be fixed. I was in for a rude awakening when in the six months after all my problems did not go away and I continued to, to deal with depression and anxiety and all of these things. And um, a lot of that was me needing outside care outside of the sport system to be able to help me. And so I think when we're talking to practitioners, just recognizing that the same problems um, that violence is, is, has a lot of impacts on your mental health. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean only sport practitioners need to be involved. And it is, it took me at least, um, a lot of people from a lot of different areas of expertise to, um, to help these problems. And so again, just removing an athlete from a sport, um, doesn't solve, <laughs> solve all these problems and just understanding that there is, um, a need for care for, for athletes. And, um, I was 23 when I left the sport. And so again, it's not just focusing on children athlete, but, but athletes from, from any age and any, um, at any level of sport. Um, another big misnomer that we, um, have is that encourage again, along with encouraging the athlete to leave, there's a, a lot of reasons why athletes don't leave. And so I did want to touch a little bit on why athletes continue to stay in these environments. Um, and so I can talk about my own personal experience. Even in high school, I was training five or six hours a day. I went to a special high school where um, that allowed me to compete half days and only go to school half days. And so half of my life was really being in sport. And it's the thing that I loved. It's the thing that um, I cared about the most. All, a lot of my friends to this day are friends that I had from high school swimming. Um, and so for me, it wasn't just the thing I did. It was part of who I was. Um, I was Aaron, the synchronized swimmer. That was that was my label. That was who I believed I was. Um, and so as much as people would try to convince me not to be there and that, that happened more as people understood the environment I was in. For me, it wasn't an option because it was so much of who I was as a person. Um, and I also had really big goals. I wanted to go to the Olympics and it came to a point where I wanted to go to the Olympics more than anything else. And so it became, even though I recognized that my mental health was suffering, I had goals that were bigger than that. And so again, that conversation of you should just leave and, and take care of your health, I, I chose not to prioritize that. Um, and while that was the choice I made, I hope that athletes um, moving forward do not have to make that decision where they have to um, compromise their health and their well-being to be able to achieve their goals. And I think one thing we've kind of learned in the past few years, and we're going to touch on a little bit, is, is there is a way to be successful without breaking down athletes and making them feel small. And there is a way to empower athletes and build them up and also get the almost a better performance out of them because they are healthy and happy and, and motivated to continue going on. So a lot of the work that we've done in the past few years um, is talking about understanding the scope of maltreatment in, um, in Canada and across the world. There's been a lot of research being done to understand the prevalence of maltreatment. Um, so Dr. Kerr and I, along with um, Dr. Ashley Sterling, conducted a study in 2019 in partnership with AthletesCan um, to understand what the scope of the problem was, particularly among national team athletes. Um, so we conducted a survey that was online. It was anonymous. Um, and we had almost a thousand respondents to the survey. Um, this survey included both male and female um, athletes, all of whom had been on a national team or had competed on the national team um, within 10 years prior to the survey in 2019. Um, the average age of participants was 27. Um, and we did have athletes who um, identified as having a disability, although that sample was fairly low. Um, some other identity characteristics, we did have some athletes that identified as ra racialized LGBTQ2I plus and indigenous. Um, however, we did note when we compare this to the uh, Canadian population, it is very skewed. 
Um, and so this is something that the lack of diversity is something that we we wanted to identify within the national team landscape, particularly, and those who participate in the survey is understanding how come um, there are a lot of groups that are missing from these kinds of conversations. So what we found from this study was we asked athletes about um, psychologically harmful, physically harmful, sexual harm, and neglectful behaviors. And what we found was across the board, uh, psychological harmful behaviors were the most commonly experienced by national team athletes, followed by neglect, uh, sexual harm, and physical harm. Um, this finding was kind of in interesting to us, and maybe not me in particular because of my experiences, but um, because the focus up until that point had really been on sexual abuse, and particularly in, in practice and in research, a lot of the a lot of what we were hearing in the media was about sexual harm. Um, and so understanding that how common psychological harm and neglect were, um, were something that was really important for us. And we're going to drill down a little bit more on psychological harm in this presentation too, because it is the most common behavior. We also looked at harm um, by gender and between current and retired athletes, finding that um, female athletes identified across the board more experiences of all types of harm. Uh, compared to male athletes, and so indicating a, a vulnerability, particularly towards female athletes. Um, again, our sample really lacked diversity in gender, and we did identify that we did look at sex indicators rather than gender, and so I think um, we, we do like to say if we were going to do it again, that's one thing that we would try to understand a little bit more is, is the gender diverse spectrum, because again, there are a lot of vulnerabilities within people that do um, identify outside of the binary. Um, another interesting thing that comes across in this slide is that retired athletes um, identified more experiences than current athletes for all types of harm. We find this interesting, not because we think things are getting better, but because when you are out of sport, you often can recontextualize your experiences a little bit more. You see things a little bit differently. Um, and because you are outside of sport, you, you, you may also have a bit more safety in terms of reporting your experiences. And so when we look at this, it's so easy to say things are getting better in Canada, but we, what we are actually finding is that retired athletes actually just have a different perspective and can identify these behaviors as, as things that are wrong versus when you're in it. And, and again, all these things that we talk about, the normalization um, and the acceptance of a lot of these behaviors. And so we'll give you a couple of examples of um, the behaviors that we uh, looked at in particular. So again, in the survey, we did not ask athletes, um, did you experience emotional abuse, physical abuse, anything like that? Because a lot of people don't really know what those mean. So instead, we just asked, um, did you experience X behavior? Um, so for psychologically harmful behaviors, we found that being shouted at, um, being gossiped about, or having lies told about someone, being put down, embarrassed, or humiliated, or being intentionally ignored because of bad behavior, or um, poor performance, sorry. Uh, were the most commonly experienced by athletes. And again, particularly those psychologically harmful behaviors, um, these are behaviors that are often associated with good coaching or um, kind of that rough and tumble NFL mentality coaching that are often normalized within the sport culture and are sometimes seen as like a normal and accepted practice within sport to motivate athletes. In terms of neglectful behaviors, we found that unequal treatment was, was the most commonly um, identified. And then after that is training when injured or exhausted. So when someone's injured, being pressured to perform um, and continue with their training regimen, um, feeling pressured to sacrifice or being told to sacrifice their career educational goals. And so to have that singular focus within sport um, and training in unsafe environments was another one that was commonly identified. Um, in terms of sexually harmful behaviors, we found that um, sexist jokes and remarks were, were the highest, followed by intrusive glances and explicit communication. Um, again, when we've had these conversations and, and talking about this data, we often find that people are like, well, those don't seem as bad. But again, these are in, as, as some of the more egregious behaviors when it comes to sexual harm. But again, it, it's really telling of the culture that we're in and, and the culture that's being created where these things are the things that are normalized and accepted. And that lends itself to an environment where more things can happen. Um, and so even though these things seem small, it's that combination and that culmination of those behaviors that, that 
lend themselves to explaining what the culture is and what is accepted and what's tolerated, um, which can lead to lead to a lot more problematic behaviors down the line, even if they're not as common. And again, um, we always give the disclaimer while we do focus on emotional abuse, any amount of sexual harm is, is awful and terrible. And even though those numbers aren't as high, that's still a lot of athletes that experience these behaviors. And so um, really needing to acknowledge that all of these behaviors are not okay and all of them need to be focused on. Um, physical, physically harmful behaviors was our lowest category. Um, and again, we one of the reasons that we think that this is the case is because um, a lot of them are regulated and, and explicitly not tolerated. I think it's very different if a parent or an observer um, saw a coach yelling at an athlete versus the coach hitting an athlete. I think in the second case, we all know that that's bad and that would be reported on. And so that's potentially one of the reasons that a lot of these behaviors like being slapped or forced to the ground or hit with an object are much lower is because we do, we can see them, they're visible. Um, it's very easy to like determine what is or isn't okay. Um, and so this is something that we see that there are a lot of regulations around um, and potentially could lend themselves to having lower numbers. Um, the one exception to this was excessive exercise or exercise as punishment. Um, and so this means having, being for, forcing athletes to engage in exercises that are not 100% related to training. So having to do laps when you're late, having to um, do sprints until you throw up because you didn't play well yesterday. There's a lot of examples of exercise being used as a punitive tactic that aren't related to training that um, is what is mostly identified in terms of physically harmful behaviors. And again, we did find a lot, even though our population of uh, people in equity deserving populations was low, we did still find some significant uh, differences between these populations. So for example, we found that racialized athletes reported significantly more experiences of physical harm, um, which at first we thought was an interesting finding until we kind of took back, took a step back and started looking at um, a lot of the outside culture uh, outside of sports. So um, particularly around Black Lives Matter and the physical violence that occurs, seeing that those same things are echoed in sport is was really telling to us and was a really interesting finding about how sport, again, is, is sometimes acts in isolation, but is often a mirror of what's happening in um, in external cultures. Uh, we found that LGBTQ2I plus athletes reported significantly more experiences of sexual harm. Um, we didn't find any significant differences between para and able-bodied athletes or para and non-para athletes, sorry. Um, but it doesn't mean that those doesn't exist. We recognized, again, reflecting on our, our survey that a lot of our language was not para specific and there are a lot of issues with para athletes, particularly around classification processes and processes with um, aids and support staff that we didn't really include in the survey. And so um, that is something that we've acknowledged as something that needs more uh, attention to. And then in terms of Indigenous athletes, and again, this is important, particularly as we come to Truth and Reconciliation Day, um, that there aren't a lot, there weren't a lot of Indigenous athletes in our study. Um, and this is something that needs a lot more care and attention to. Um, in terms of emotional abuse, I did want to highlight a little bit of what this looks like. And so we conducted a study in 2020 on um, the experiences of emotional abuse. And so I just wanted to provide a couple examples that came out um, in, in that of examples of things that athletes have told us that were, were kind of these, again, these gray areas, these things that they thought were normal at the time, but then... Um, then reflected on, or or in some in some cases, we're told not that we're not okay by their therapists or or by people outside of sport um, when they were trying to process their emotions. So being called useless, a waste of time, um, stupid, um, and it was really just like everyone on the team was experiencing these behaviors, um, being ignored again, being potentially ignored, no feedback, not being talked to, um, and again, just being told that they weren't worth fighting for. Um, again, all these problematic behaviors that we are seeing time and time again in sport. And Dr. Kerr talked to, uh, touched on this briefly as well, but just this idea that all of these things are normalized and sometimes justified um, as a tool for performance. Um, and so again, horrible conditions were not just tolerated, but glorified. 
um, was what one athlete um, talked about in one of the studies we had conducted. Um, again, just like the justification of these behaviors by um, sport organizations. So they're not, they're not harmful. They're just passionate about what they do. There's an excuse that athlete or coaches can um, not have to regulate their emotions because of their passion for the sport. Um, a lot of uh, turning a blind eye, particularly towards mi microaggressions, including um, bullying of young LGBT athletes. Um, so there's just, uh, essentially, there's so many examples that it's hard to pull any, but a lot of them are just so normalized within sport that it's hard to um, really identify what's going on. Um, and again, just because of my own experience, I did want to touch a little bit on body shaming in sport because I think it's, again, something that's so normalized within sport, but does have a lot of implications um, for athletes, both in sport and again, once they leave sport, a lot of these behaviors, particularly with, um, particularly not exclusive to um, female athletes and women athletes in those formative years. So between 16, 19, 20, um, when these are the messages that they're being told, these things are are becoming part of who they are as a person. And so it's really hard to, um, for me to sit and watch, but also knowing that this constantly happens. And so some examples are um, the constant monitoring. So this includes weigh-ins, especially public weigh-ins with their team, um, being watched and monitored in terms of what their body shape looks like um, or having specific weight requirements. Um, another area of body shaming is the negative comments. Um, so pointing out what they were doing wrong, pointing out uh, specific body parts, like your boobs are too big, your bum is too big. All of these little things are very common within sport. We also identified that there are a lot of forced dieting and forced restrictions placed on athletes. Um, and so mandating what, what someone can or can't eat, can or can't drink. Um, and even just understanding the cultural perspective of it's not necessarily um, words that are targeted towards a person, but if you're seeing other athletes being um, told these same things. There is a lot of um, athletes are smart and they know what's going on. And so if they're hearing what's happening to their teammate or if their teammate's getting bullied for something, they're going to internalize that a lot as well and, and, and start regulating their own behavior based on what's going on in the, in the culture that they're in. Um, and for a lot of athletes, this became um, something that they believed was the most important part of their sport. So um, that their weight became a bigger value than any other part of them, um, which again is really problematic, particularly with developing athletes. And so we're going to go into a little bit of the effects of um, all types of maltreatment. So again, this goes back to that 2019 study. We looked at experiences of maltreatment and correlated them with different um, mental health indicators. Um, so there was significant correlations between experiencing any type of maltreatment um, and, and um, eating disorder behaviors. So thinking about um, engaging in, 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 in those kinds of behaviors, actually engaging about, and then interestingly, very few have actually been diagnosed with um, an eating disorder, which is really interesting considering how common the behaviors are, not necessarily um, identifying it as such or getting treated for it, um, is also very problematic within the sport world. And again, that speaks a lot to that normalization of a lot of these behaviors. There's also correlations between um, self-harming behaviors. And so thoughts about engaging in self-harm and engaging in self-harm, there was a significant correlation between all types of maltreatment. Um, and unfortunately, when we asked about seeking for mental health issues, those numbers were quite low um, and, and particularly not feeling supported by their organization when re receiving the help that they need um, was very, very low. And so I think it's just, again, when we think about care and support, um, understanding that there are a lot of barriers towards athletes um, reaching out and, and receiving that help. Um, and particularly with emotional abuse, since we have been focusing on that because it is the most commonly experienced. Um, there are a wide variety of outcomes, including depression, anxiety, eating disorders, um, feeling the need to leave their sport or contemplating leaving a sport, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, negative memories from sports. So a lot of athletes really still, even many years later, getting emotional about their experiences um, when they reflect on it or avoiding reflecting on their experiences because of the negative um, behaviors that they experienced. Um, and a lot, a lack of pride, so not even feeling proud of their their accomplishments, which are often very high within a lot of the athletes that we speak about, we speak to. 
Um, and so we also conducted a study particularly on emotional abuse. And I believe that's um, in one of the links that we have provided in our resources. Um, but we found that athletes across time had ex negative experiences of emotional abuse. So they had, they had experiences in sport, um, including just feeling really negative. So um, not wanting to go to practice, feeling scared to go to practice, feeling like they weren't good enough, um, fear of repercussions, um, just general states of anxiety, um, and e even to the point of suicide ideation. And again, similar to what I touched on with my own experience, leaving sport didn't necessarily fix the problem. So sometimes there was a sense of release, but then sometimes it almost accentuated problems that they didn't know were happening in sport. Um, and so really trying to navigate um, and put themselves back together and, and understand the scope of the problem that had been created in sport. And a lot of these um, behaviors continued even further five or 10 years on, um, a lot of athletes still reflecting on their experiences and, and still recognizing that there was a lot of um, negative implications for, for their experiences in sport. And so just understanding that um, there is a lot of care needed for athletes who have experienced emotional abuse or any type of harm in sport. And with that, I'll talk, I'll pass it back to Dr. Crow. who will talk about some of the disclosure and reporting. Great, thanks, Erin. Um, so as part of this uh, national survey, we, we then asked these participants, these national team athletes, if uh, they had ever told anyone about the behaviors that Erin um, has just described. So as she mentioned earlier, we, we didn't use the terms abuse, harassment, bullying, or hazing when we asked them because uh, these behaviors are so normalized that they themselves did not characterize them as abuse. But if we ask them, you know, did you uh, disclose to anyone that you were the recipient of sexist remarks or uh, constant intimidation or humiliating comments, you can see here that less than half of both current and retired athletes ever told anyone about these experiences. And they were given options of uh, peers, teammates, um, uh, partners, parents, uh, et cetera. And it's quite astounding that uh, less than half ever mentioned these experiences to anyone else. And then the statistics get even worse when we ask about, did you submit a formal report or a formal complaint of the experiences? So here you can see 16% and 13% respectively um, uh, ever reported formally uh, their experiences. And so we asked them, um, you know, why, why this was, and they were very clear about why they didn't speak about their experiences. Uh, there was this culture of silence that they talked about and that has been written about in the research uh, before. And it's, it's clear that these are highly motivated young people, they have goals and dreams that they're determined to uh, achieve. And they know that raising concerns will put those dreams in jeopardy. Um, so this was a, a, a real deterrent to bringing forward their concerns. Um, there was also clear indication that they either didn't know who they could talk to, about their experience, or they knew that there was no one. And that included their parents, because as soon as they told their parents, um, they also may be in jeopardy because their parents uh, wouldn't put up with it, or they would talk to the coach. And the evidence indicated that uh, as soon as the parent complained to the coach, it was the athlete who suffered at the next practice. So athletes learn to, um, to experience these things in silence. They also uh, were very aware of the consequences of reporting and that there would be uh, negative repercussions. So not only in terms of their own career, but other forms of what in this case they, they talked about harassment. And that could come from teammates 
because as soon as a report comes forward, it disrupts the team dynamics, this team cohesion, everybody stays together, what, what happens in the locker room stays in the locker room kind of, uh, kind of approach. Um, and this, this other quote pertains to the self-regulating nature of sports, that reporting to the sport organization is like asking them to incriminate themselves because they all have invested interest in the performance of these athletes or the team and anything that disrupts that, uh, seeking that goal, achieving that goal um, is, is uh, not a priority. So again, um, returning to, to what it is about um, sport that makes it so vulnerable to the occurrence of, of maltreatment and also the difficulties in addressing it. Uh, one is the access to young people and um, uh, those who work in child protection uh, and have access to the, the, the deep, dark, uh, uh, nasty parts of social media will, will say that um, predators are keenly aware that sport is a, an environment in which you can get easy access to young people. Uh, the power and authority of the coach, that is not only power attributed uh, by the athletes, but also their parents. Parents will often relinquish control over to the coach because the coach knows best. They have a previous history of putting um, athletes on the podium and to such a point that um, in some previous work, athletes have referred to their coach as a godlike figure. I've talked about the socialization of, of parents and others. Um, there, there's also been material written on complicit bystanders. Um, the, uh, and I'll come back to the sexual abuse later, but the psychological abuse is something that occurs in public. So, Coaches are taught uh, what's called the rule of two, which is that you should never be uh, alone with an athlete. There should always be another adult within earshot. That may be helpful for preventing sexual abuse, which often occurs in, uh, in private, but it doesn't do anything to address the most predominant form of harm, and that's the psychological abuse which takes place in training environments where there are other coaches, there are parents watching, there may be sports science staff, uh, and yet everybody accepts this as normalized behavior. Um, most sport organizations have invested in background and criminal records checks. Uh, these are of course an, an important part of uh, prevention. However, they're extremely limited. Um, they only identify those who have been criminally charged. Most cases of harmful behaviors in sport do not reach that level, uh, and nor do they reach that threshold. You know, if you think about the psychologically harmful behaviors, those are not ones that the police are going to be involved in. There's not going to be a, a criminal charge. And so what you see is... Um, uh, coaches being let go of their contracts from a volunteer parent board that just enables them to move to a different club. Um, I've talked about the, the emphasis on winning and performance. Uh, what I haven't mentioned is that competitive sport at the highest level in, in, uh, in Canada is funded on the basis of performance and performance um, in a very singular way. So the amount of money the government gives um, Swimming Canada or Gymnastics Canada or Hockey Canada is determined by how well the athletes do and their potential for uh, podium finishes. So you can imagine with that kind of funding structure that there's a pursuit of performance outcomes without the necessary regard for the processes by which those performance outcomes are attained. 
And so where is the emphasis on athlete health and well-being in that funding formula? And this is something that many of us are, are advocating for change. Um, we've also talked about the normalization of unhealthy and, and uh, abusive, neglectful uh, developmental strategies. Um, this is also in part due to the self-regulating nature of sport. You know, why is it that you can call an athlete fat or stupid or a waste of time and any other adult, whether a parent or a teacher, if they said that to a young person, there would be consequences. Um, the early specialization of sport, this kind of isolation, singular focus on a, on a sport, particularly if, if kids are really talented at it, means that they develop an athletic identity very early on in life, which makes it, as Aaron suggested, very hard to leave uh, because uh, athletes struggle with who they are if they're no longer an athlete. So the notion that they're experiencing harm, why don't they just leave? It, it's, it's a very complicated and complex uh, picture. Um, the assumptions of methods to build team camaraderie, and maybe we can come back to this in the, the Q&A because I, I saw some questions around this, but um, these are uh, assumptions like using exercise as, as punishment that are thought to build team camaraderie that evidence will say there actually does not reach that, um, that outcome. And that many of the methods that are used in sport around teaching and learning just are not aligned with all the research evidence we have around how young people learn, how they're motivated, how to, to um, develop talent. So these practices are, are outdated in terms of parenting and education, and yet they persist in a sport environment. And then there's this interesting misperception, and we, we hear this when we uh, work with, with coaches and sport administrators, that um, somehow the health and well being of athletes is mutually exclusive from uh, performance outcomes, rather than looking at the best way to achieve performance is through health and uh, well being. Oops. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about what all this means for prevention and um, implications for practitioners. And uh, I'll start with this, this quote from Simone Biles, um, who was a survivor of Nassar's abuses. Um, and I think she sums it up better than, than, than I can. And that is, that of course uh, there was a predator uh, involved in this story, but how do you explain the fact that he um, perpetrated his harms across hundreds of young gymnasts across decades? The only way that could happen is if other people either knew and failed to act, or they suspected and failed to act, or they tried to act, and ran up against structural bound, uh, structural uh, barriers to actually intervening. So it was a, a real systemic problem and it continues to be in, in sport. So I like this quote from uh, Mitch Garabedian, who's a, a Boston lawyer who represented um, the survivors of the Catholic church abuses and some of Nassar's survivors. Um, and he says, if it takes a village to raise a child, it also takes a village to abuse one. And again, this gets at the systemic approach that's needed for prevention and intervention. Um, and Ali Raisman also emphasizes this, just saying, you know, if because the, the, the uh, proceedings after the Nassar case revealed that these athletes did tell people. They did complain about the behavior. They talked about feeling uncomfortable about seeing this physician, um, but they didn't get the protections from other adults who had a duty of care responsibilities 
to address the situation and, and were unsuccessful. So um, many of you have seen Bronfenbrenner's model before, but it, it's uh, a great way to illustrate the systemic approach that's needed to address maltreatment in sport, that we need to look beyond this kind of uh, finding the, the, the pedophiles and the predators or the bad apples in the system to really getting rid of bad structures and systems. And boy, are we seeing a real life example in Hockey Canada right now um, that they, the, the, the same people who uh, covered up uh, cases of abuse for years, um, can they be the same people who fix the system? Uh, you may have heard uh, recently about a survey that went out from Hockey Canada asking stakeholders if the media were overblowing the whole issue. So um, really speaks to the need to address the structures and system. So at the individual level, yes, we need to educate both the adults and the athletes about power and how power can and, and should be used and deal with the isolation of athletes. Um, looking at the nature of coach-athlete relationships and how to um, diminish that power um, a differential or, or learn to use power in a positive way and share it with athletes. At the organizational level, there are now codes of conduct. There are lots of educational programs, although a weakness in this area is empirical um, uh, evaluation of their effectiveness or lack of effectiveness. Uh, a place for athletes to go that's not their sport organization. Uh, a neutral, safe place to go. And certainly at the societal level, um, the, the media is now um, helping to bring this issue to the surface and also to, um, to try and infiltrate sport with the same kind of person-centered education that we have seen in uh, parenting and education would go a long way. So the, the Me Too movement uh, has been uh, very helpful in trying to address maltreatment in sport, um, really giving athletes a voice that it's okay to speak up and that when you speak up, there are supports for you. But it also, as I think, enlightened athletes in terms of how, how power should and should not be used. Athletes are being far more vocal now about their experiences. Uh, there's a lot happening, happening in lot, sorry, online in terms of a social support for athletes and giving them a voice. It's also provided a little more clarity, at least in the sport world, about expected conduct and this notion that uh, what, what happens in sport would not be accepted in other walks of life. Now, it, you know, power uh, in, in coaching is an interesting area because, of course, sport emerged from uh, the military. And so we still see remnants of this autocratic kind of one directional military style approach to dealing with young people. And this approach relies on punishment, fear, uh, shaming, humiliating, et cetera. Um, and what we need and what is slowly emerging uh, is more humanistic approaches that we see in education where coaches and athletes share power, where discipline replaces punishment strategies. Um, we claim that sport teaches young people life skills. The only way they'll learn that is if they share in that power, if they're engaged in discussion and decision-making, and if they have a voice in the decisions that affect them. So we need a culture shift in children and youth sport. Um, sport in Canada uh, is, is a child populated domain that is self-regulating autonomous. And as said in the introduction, 
this is a major part of uh, why maltreatment occurs and is allowed to persist at the rates it is. Right now, there's a lot happening in this space on the national and international level. Uh, the current Minister of Heritage Canada, which includes sport, has declared sport in a state of crisis. Um, athletes are now uh, mobilizing to insist on change. Um, we've seen, for example, um, players refusing to play unless certain initiatives are put in place. So they're, they're experiencing a lot more uh, advocacy and effective agency. And of course, there, we, there are class action lawsuits in at least two sports. Um, uh, so again, very much in the public domain, lots of pressure to do something about this problem. So in terms of takeaway messages, um, although the study we, we relied on for most of the presentation was at, at the national level of sport, uh, we can share with you that other research studies have shown that it happens at all levels of sport. It adds a layer of complexity to gender-based violence because of the kind of toxic masculinity roots in sport, the militar militaristic uh, history of sport, and that while the responses to an athlete who's experienced maltreatment may share many similarities with dealing with um, non-athletes who have had such experiences, an important difference is the way in which sport is so embedded um, in the athlete's identity that without sport, athletes often struggle to redefine themselves. And then because of that, quitting is, um, may not be uh, the, uh, a viable, let alone appropriate solution. Um, so, and, and of course the parents um, who often become socialized to accept these harmful practices as normal, and uh, research studies indicate that athletes learn quite quickly because of the repercussions they suffer to stay silent even with their parents. So we'll look forward to the Q&A. And uh, again, thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this session. And we look forward to, uh, to a discussion. Thank you, Gretchen, and, and thank you, Aaron. And we have so many questions that we're going to move right into that. So that's uh, wonderful that that's where you'd like to go to. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Jasmine Tabibi, to start off um, the questioning. Sure. Thanks, Linda. Thank you, Gretchen and Aaron, for your presentation. Um, the first question uh, relates to um, neglect, and if you could please explain how you ca characterize neglect in the study, um, and would you be able to describe what an unsafe environment was defined as? Was it physical safety, psychological, or a combination of different types of factors? Okay, well, maybe I can start and, and Aaron can weigh in with what I miss. Um, so we characterize um, uh, neglect as the omission of care. Uh, when someone has a, a duty or responsibility to care, to provide for basic needs, mm -hmm. and they fail in that duty to, um, to, to fulfill their responsibilities. So it may be, for example, um, uh, a team is training in a very hot environment and uh, there's not sufficient hydration provided or sufficient breaks in the training to, uh, to be hydrated. It may be an athlete complaining of pain or injury and the coach fails to attend to it medically. Um, or there's medical advice not to return an athlete to play after a concussion, and that advice is, uh, is ignored. Um, unsafe training conditions can be everything from um, the equipment being unsafe. Uh, the, it could be physical in terms of equipment being unsafe. 
but it could also be um, psychological in terms of, um, let's say an athlete is, is anxious, depressed, um, um, even if they don't have uh, diagnosed mental health challenges um, or, or feeling overburdened and stressed. And uh, those kinds of feelings are ignored in favor of pushing forward with performance. But maybe I'll, I'll turn, turn it to Erin quickly because she may have other more uh, applied examples to offer. Yeah, um, and I guess in the study, we really just looked at um, different behaviors. And, and I will admit, even within the study, it's a lot of them aren't necessarily like it's not clear cut. Like abuse is a lot of it is cultural problems and cultural issues. And so it was hard for us to even and define. And we, we've had a lot of discussion with other, other researchers around the world of what is categorized as neglect or emotional abuse. And sometimes there is that gray area. Um, so we did our best based on, again, that notion of a mission of care, um, but really trying to understand how we can um, identify the behaviors specifically, and then also understand like the cultural levels that allow for all of these behaviors to come, whether they're emotionally abusive or physically abusive or a combination. Thank you, both of you. That was really helpful. And another clarification question and a, a slightly different focus is whether you would speak a little more to maltreatment surrounding harassment and psychological harm that occurs specifically to elite athletes who are adults. Um, uh, so in terms of, we, we encompassed in this, um, our definition of maltreatment, um, that it could occur within uh, power relationships in terms of authority figures. So that would be coach athlete relationship. And some of the athletes in our study were adults. Um, there could also be um, bullying, uh, psychological bullying taking place between peers. So a piece of, of the study that we didn't present here was uh, who were the perpetrators of these harms. And in all, in all cases, except for sexual harm, coaches were the uh, primary and, and by a great majority, the perpetrator of psychological harm, neglect and physical harm. In terms of sexual harms, it was actually teammates who were the predominant perpetrators, but closely followed by, by coaches. So um, our study did include those under, or sorry, um, those uh, athletes who were adults, particularly because we include, included retired athletes, but we did ask um, who the perpetrators were and that allowed us to distinguish between um, abuse, which we characterized as being with an authority figure, versus bullying, which we characterized as being be between teammates. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Gretchen. The next question is, have you studied or do you know of any research that suggests that there's a connection between athletes enduring abuse in sport and their experiences of, of abuse at home? Do these have an impact on how they are impacted by abuse in sport? I'm not aware of, of research that looks at that question, although relatedly, we do have indications that athletes who um, have not experienced harm or sorry, uh, abuse at home, but experience abuse in sport, uh, have a tendency to end up in interpersonal intimate dating relationships that are characterized also by that harm. And maybe Aaron, you can talk a little bit about the qualitative findings that you you uh, gleaned around this topic. Yeah. So particularly when we were studying emotional abuse and the the long term effects of emotional abuse, we did have some athletes talk about um, ending up in or, or finding themselves in relationships that uh, like interpersonal relationships and, and romantic relationships that were characterized by um, emotional abuse and a lot of. There's one athlete in particular who talked about this experience with me and, and she basically said like, that's, that's how I was conditioned. That's what I knew love to be because that's how I had, had been demonstrated to me 
from a young age in sport. And so those are the kind of behaviors that I um, gravitated towards, even though I knew it was wrong. And so definitely just experiencing these kinds of behaviors, particularly at a young age. Um, we haven't dug too much into that yet, but I think it was a really interesting and prominent finding that we had with um, some athletes. I, if I could just add one other thought related to that, um, it's it's not empirical, but um, I, I serve as a, a volunteer athlete welfare officer and receive complaints of um, uh, of uh, abuse. And from my own experience, um, there are many parents out there who uh, were anything but abusive, and they were really. Um, not aware of what was going on in the sport environment because the training was closed the athlete had learned not to tell their parents and the devastation they experience um, uh, when they do find out what happened and uh, uh, it is just astounding and so heartbreaking um, so empirically i don't have the answer to that question but I certainly would feel very confident in saying that um, there are many, you know, well-informed, uh, well-intentioned parents out there who uh, are just awestruck when they find out what, what has occurred. Gretchen, thank you for that. And I just want to add that some people have shared with the panelists that they were the parents of young people and didn't realize that this was going on and they participated in today's webinar. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. You talked about in terms of prevention, um, the importance of an independent or third party organization that an athlete could disclose or report to. And one of the participants wants to clarify, does such an organization exist anywhere at this time? Mm -hmm. And if it did, would they have the ability to hold offenders accountable? And using the term offenders just as a way of defining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, it's, a, it's a very pertinent question because there is such an indep independent body in the works, uh, the, um, in large part because of, of this study, the federal minister responded by creating an independent uh, body. It's called the uh, Office of Sport Integrity Commissioner. It's currently in development. Um, there are many questions and um, unresolved issues in its development. And I know Erin is on the Athletes Advisory Board for this um, uh, development. So I will turn over to her, but one of the, one of the main problems is that this body will only deal with concerns coming from national level athletes. And so it ignores the vast majority of sport participants who are, are participating at the provincial level or the local club or the community level. So all of those athletes, which are what 90, 95% of sport participants uh, still will not have a place to go. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Aaron to kind of round out that. Yeah, so it is um, a very new thing that has come out and it opened in June, officially opened its doors. So it's very, very fresh and um, it is a huge undertaking. There's, there's been a lot of requests from athletes from other people um, in the study. A lot of, a lot of athletes did, um, did request for an independent body. So the, the fact that this is happening and the minister has put a lot of money towards it as well. So there's a lot of, um, positives towards it. It's still, again, very new and it's very um, unique in its kind. So it's going to take a while to get, it's not going to be perfect right away, I think is kind of the message. And um, we just kind of have to appreciate that it is a first step and there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but it definitely, um, it's, it's, a, it's a first step. Um, again, one of the things that is we do have to be cautious of, and a lot of people are going to expect because there's a body, everything's going to be solved. Um, and again, recognizing that 
um, the police don't always fix everything. And while it's important to have a, a policing service or a monitoring service that can intervene and investigate, there's a lot more work that needs to be done um, from all stakeholders. And, and this is why we are excited for conversations like this and within the community to understand all of those different levels that need to be addressed and, and being able to disclose and report something is, is needed and necessary, but we also need to um, prevent it and, and need for education and, and to um, try to kind of break this culture that we've created um, in sport that is very win at all cost mentality. It is very, all of these behaviors are so ingrained within sport. Um, and so the mechanism is one aspect of how we can start to regulate that, but a lot more work needs to be done across the board to be able to really address this problem. We should also mention that there's um, now a, a helpline for athletes. Um, and uh, that's been really helpful in terms of providing, um, um, it, it, it's for a, a bit of a triage system where athletes can learn about psychological supports and how to access them. Um, so it's really helpful in terms of mental health supports. Uh, it, it doesn't really address the complaint or reporting system because it, it, it just, uh, if an athlete wishes to report, it just kicks the athlete back to the sport organization. So we're back to the same problem of not having an independent mechanism, but it is important for providing mental health support. Uh, this next question is related to training. Do you have any specific recommendations for key pieces that should be um, included in trainings at national sports organizations about bystander intervention relating to sexual and gender-based violence? Um, yes, there's, um, there is uh, in development at the Coaching Association of Canada, um, information around safe sport and some of it includes bystander uh, education. It, um, it's a tricky landscape because once you get to the community level of sport, there's a reliance on a large volunteer base. And so there's a sense that you can only ask these people to engage in so much training. So there, there are safe sport modules that all coaches are supposed to take. But as you can imagine, there are so many areas to cover that the bystander intervention is a very small piece. And as is the case with all online education, it's really hard to know, first of all, the extent to which the person is engaged in the material. And more importantly, uh, whether or not the material presented, learned in this module is actually transferred into to practice. So the whole area of evaluation of impact of educational programs. And in sport, there are tons of educational um, resources available, but unfortunately, we don't know what works, what doesn't work, and, and why. So that's a real research gap. Um, so the short answer is there is education on bystander intervention, um, and we don't know how effective it is. question that's related to that is, is there leadership from existing coaches who do use a different, more holistic way to coach? And do they have a voice as, as peer leaders in terms of the world of coaching? Do you want to take that one, Erin? Sure. Um, so this is something that we've had kind of a discussion of over um, the past couple of years is recognizing that we as researchers have spent a lot of time telling people what not to do. Um, and while that's effective, we do need to start working towards what good looks like and what that and like reinforcing those behaviors. And again, um, there was a comment about the use of punishment. It's like, OK, well, can we show like instead of using punishment, can we start exemplifying and highlighting some of the good behaviors? Um, and so right now we are doing a study in our lab um, that is highlighting um, coaches who do have really um, holistic ways of coaching and, and use a lot of positive development skills and use a lot of, um, we're, we're still trying to find the words because 
person centered or athlete centered, like all of this seems a little fr too frilly for coaches. So we're trying to figure out the wording that is most appropriate. That's going to, um, get, uh, get coaches to buy into using these behaviors. Um, but we are currently doing a study with coaches, um, who, who have positive, um, and holistic natured behaviors and, and th that are at high performance levels. And so a lot of the coaches that we're talking to have won multiple medals at the Olympics and, um, are really the exempl exemplifying, um, that you can have performance and, and, um, personal development at the same time. And a lot of these coaches will say the, the only way that I can get athletes to perform is by ensuring that they're okay as a person to making sure that they are treated as a whole person. Um, the, the term, like their, if their house is in order, they'll do well. Um, and that you can't be, uh, just a person that you can't take the athlete out of, of themselves and they're, they're not a machine and they are a whole person. And so understanding that we need to develop them as athletes is, is a key to performance success. Um, so that's something that we are currently working on. Uh, we've also done the same interviews with athletes who have really echoed those statements of, I could, and sometimes it's, I can perform either way, but I, I much prefer being in an environment where I am treated um, as a person and treated well and treated um, and cared for and, and feeling all those things because that does motivate me and that does make me want to be in that environment. And some athletes that have come out of an abusive situation and found a coach that is, um, it does coach in a much better way and, and their performance skyrocketed because of that environment. And so this justification that these behaviors are, are a tool for motivation, um, we are trying to kind of disprove this and, and exemplify what good behaviors are. So hopefully that data will, that's our, that's our next project. Hopefully well, next time we speak, uh, we'll have a little bit more to share on that. <laughs> that sounds very encouraging. Going back to your research, um, looking at reasons why athletes do not report, did your research also find that parents can also contribute to the culture of sport, either through financial obligation or living vicariously through the athlete? Uh, yes, there's, there's been quite a, a bit of research on this topic, and it's, it's very interesting that uh, it's both the socialization process that, that uh, well-educated, well-informed, well-intentioned parents uh, start in this process and then they learn to normalize uh, certain norms. Um, there's also work on what's called achievement by proxy where um, um, parents who had wanted to achieve in sport have a talented child and uh, consciously or subconsciously uh, seek to achieve their unmet uh, goals through their, their child. And um, so that, that has been well documented in the literature. One of the questions, a number of our participants today um, work in sexual assault centers and provide support. And one of the questions was, if, would, is the fact that if there was somebody under 16 that reached out to a sexual assault center, the fact that they might have to report or would have to report if there was sexual um, abuse to a child protection service, would that, because of the silencing and the fear of repercussions in terms of their own athletic career, um, would that prevent them for going to a body such as a sexual assault center if they could um, do things that would be more welcoming um, to young people? I, I think the, the um, I, I think the research would say that uh, athletes in those circumstances uh, would tend to be reluctant to report to anybody. Um, because they know what the repercussions were, will be for their careers, uh, but also because they, um, they're groomed. Uh, a, a classic uh, a grooming um, to think that uh, this is either normal or if, that they are um, in love with their coach, their coach loves them, um, so there's all kinds of reasons, but uh, I think regardless of whether we're talking about a sexual assault center, uh, child protection, or friends or family, 
um, the, the, the research would tell us they're, they're just reluctant to come forward. Jasmine, one more question. Yes, I think we only have time for one more question. And I think it's a great question to end off with. Um, for those who are involved in sports and have big dreams of going to the Olympics, beyond competition and results, what would be your advice for young women and young girls? Hmm. You want to go first, Erin? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I, I know exactly how to answer this question, but I think one of the things that we often start these discussions are is the reason that we talk about this is because we do love sport and we think that there are so many values of sport um, beyond medals. And, and I can speak to this from my own experiences. I like I hardly remember like the color of the medal I won, but I remember the experience of going to worlds or even, you know, like to club competitions. Um, again, I mentioned like last weekend I was at a wedding of one of my high school friends and we have so many jokes and memories and we are able to reminisce so much about all of the things that we did when we were younger. And so um, understanding that like the value of sport isn't medals. And I think this is where we are in this weird situation where every like, per, like our, our funding system is driven by performance. Um, and yet when you talk about what, why, why sport exists and why the government funds sport is because of participation and being healthy and being happy and like all of the benefits of sport that we, we started this um, presentation talking about. And so I think that there's just so much value in sport and um, so much more than medals and, and so many more things that occur in sport, um, which is why we do the work that we do is because we do love it. And, and there's so many more reasons than, than winning um, in, in, my, in my experience and my perspective, so. And I guess I, I would add, um, it, it's similar to the ways in which parents teach uh, young children about, you know, healthy, or unhealthy touching or appropriate or inappropriate touching. Um, I, I would say that to tell young girls, um, if, if you experience something that would be odd coming from your parents or your teacher, um, they, they should tell somebody. And, uh, and hopefully they, they will have someone to tell. But I think that is, is you know, how can we break apart from dealing with the funding structure and all of that on an individual level, how can we break that cycle of normalization? And I think it would start there. You know, anytime uh, a parent's told you're not allowed to watch training, that should be a red flag. Um, and anytime a child is spoken to in a way that makes them upset or cry or whatever, um, that should be the, a red flag for them, and and hopefully then they should be encouraged to speak up about that. A wonderful way to end what has been just a wonderful hour and a half. Um, the comments in the chat uh, show people's appreciation for your knowledge, your research, your expertise, and also to you, Erin, for sharing your personal experience. That uh, always is so very meaningful. And uh, we all appreciate that. And I hope we do have a chance to have you join us again, um, Dr. Kerr and Aaron Wilson, who may be Dr. Wilson by then, and um, that we will have a chance to, to hear more about these things that are fledging, just starting, and also the research um, that you're undertaking now. So thank you so much. And to our participants, Please know that October 4th, we have another resource spotlight. And, and on that day, we're talking about um, connecting to communities after intimate partner violence and building opportunities for women. So we hope you'll join us then. And again, thank you to everybody for joining and to Dr. Kerr and Erin. Thank you very much. <laughs>